Hello everyone, we're going to be learning how to operate the Fly-By-Wire A320neo. This tutorial is going to be chaptered in both the description and comment section so you can easily navigate the video to learn. Now we're in the flight deck with a cold and dark setup, meaning everything is powered off. Make sure you've already configured your fuel and payload from the main menu, but if not, you can also load the fuel from the electronic flight bag. For the proper fuel and flight plan, I strongly recommend using simbrief.com. It's free and one of the greatest tools we have for flight simulation. Best of all, it's compatible with this EFB. You can load all your flight information straight from Simbrief into the EFB. You can also control the doors, ground services, and pushback. So let's get going. To move around the cockpit panels fast, you can do so with control 1 through 0. First we'll come over to the pedestal in between the captain and first officer seat. You can do this with control 6. Verify the thrust levers are at idle, engine masters are off, engine mode selector set to normal, the parking brake is on, and the landing gear is down. Now we can come up to the overhead and power on the aircraft. Turn on BAT 1 and 2. If using ground power, you can turn that on now. If it's a hot day or there is no GPU available, we can start the auxiliary power unit. Come up to the top of the overhead and run the APU fire check first. You should see both lights illuminated. Now at the bottom of the overhead, we can push the APU master switch and start. Once started, you can turn on the APU bleed. Now we're going to turn on the lights around the cockpit, starting with the overhead panel. The dome light is located here if needed. You also have two reading lights on the maintenance panel, one on the left and one on the right. The flight control unit FCU lights are located here the primary flight display and navigation display brightness are here. Same for the first officer side, it's just mirrored. The MCDU brightness is controlled here. The electronic centralized aircraft monitor brightness is here along with the lower display. And lastly the main panel floodlight which looks like this. I normally just like one click for it and the main panel and pedestal integrity light is here, along with the pedestal flood light. Now we'll come back up to the overhead and set that up. The flows work from bottom up, starting with the left side. We'll begin with the crew supply. We want to extinguish that light. Next, test the flight data recorder. Hit the ground control button and hold the CVR test button. You should get a beep, but that is yet to be added. You'll see me do several things throughout this tutorial that are not fully operational yet, but I want to show them to you anyway, so this does not become outdated. When the test is complete, hit the ground control button once again to turn it off. Everything else is good as we move up to the inertial reference system. Starting with IR1, turn to nav, wait for the on bat light to go out, then repeat for the other two knobs. And this will begin aligning the system. The alignment takes about seven minutes, but you can change this to instant in the MCDU. Go to options, realism, and then click align time. Now moving on to the bottom center of the overhead, the seat belts come on, the no smoking to auto. Emergency exit lights to arm. Now we will test the batteries, so turn the electric panel on here and turn off the batteries. You should see bat 1 and 2 voltages go out. And now turn them back on. And this is just to verify they are charging. Next turn all the fuel pumps to automatic by clicking them once. 
If the hydraulic panel is free of lights, we'll move on to the engine fire tests. On to the right side of the panel, we just want to make sure all these lights are out, and they are, so you don't really have to do much with the right side. Then come up to the maintenance panel, again, making sure all the lights are out, and verify the audio switching is set to normal. On to the main panel, you can brighten up the artificial horizon here. Sometimes you have to pull this knob to activate it, that might be a feature added later, I'm not sure, but uh, if so, now you know that you have to pull that switch, but for right now you just brighten it. Here's the clock and the stopwatch. Verify the anti-skid is on. Check the switching panel to make sure each one is on normal. You can then check the engine, mainly looking for oil quantity. Then the hydraulics doesn't seem to be functioning at this time, but that's where it will be. And now the status page, where if there were any errors, they would show here now. Down to the radio panel, making sure it's set to VHF1. The TCAS system is set to standby. Also, while we're looking at it, if you want to enter a squawk code, you hit clear and then enter the number. Now once again, verify the throttles are idle, the engine masters are off, the engine mode selector is normal, the spoilers are retracted and disarmed, the flaps are up, the rudder trim is set to zero, the parking brake is on, and the gravity gear is parked. Now we'll set up the multifunction control display unit, MCDU. Start by hitting the Flight Management Guidance Computer button, FMGC, and this displays the engines and the nav data cycle that you're running right now. Next we'll go to the initialization page. And today we'll go from San Diego KSAN to Sacramento KSMF. Enter that with a slash in between and hit return. If you have the Align IRS message here, you can hit that now and align the ref. If you have a company route, you can plug that in here as well. It's typically the format we just used for the from and to, but without the slash, and this inputs the route for you. You can get these route files from simbrief.com, but for today we're going to enter it ourselves. but I'm just showing you, for example, what the format would look like. The alternate airport will be KSFO if we need to divert. Our flight number will be Fly-By-Wire 514. Cost index will be 5, and that will be specific to your flight located in the upper right of the OFP generated by Simbrief. Our cruising altitude will be flight level 380, and that is found here. Now hit the right arrow to enter the next page. You can enter your own data or simply double click the buttons twice and it will enter the calculations for you. Now we can come over to the flight plan page, click on the from airport and departure. Again, we're in San Diego and we will be departing runway 27. Then hit the up arrow to move down the list to find our standard instrument departure. If not using one, click none. We're using the C word 2, so we'll select that with the transition being LAX. Then click insert. Next we can move down the plan to KSMF, which is our arrival, and select the arrival runway and standard terminal arrival star. For very long routes, you can select this later or just enter it now and adjust if needed once you get there. Our arrival will be on 17 left with the Sutter 3 arrival.
and New Ray as the transition. Now I made sure to have a route with at least one airway so I can show you how to enter those along with the rest of the waypoints. Airways are kind of like highways in the sky and to enter one we're going to select the waypoint right before the airway. In this case it's LAX so click airways and we'll type Juliet 1 on the left side which takes us to Derb we also have another airway next, Juliet 7 to REBRG. So just remember airways on the left and the corresponding waypoint to the right. Now let's hit insert. If you have additional waypoints to enter, you can type them in and enter them on the main flight plan page. You can then check the plan for any discontinuities. These will be blank areas in between waypoints, which means it's not connected to the flight plan beyond that waypoint. We don't have any, but if you needed to remove one or remove a waypoint, just hit clear and then click the waypoint. You also have one more chance to confirm that's what you want to do, and if not, just hit erase and it'll wipe all the changes you just made, but not the whole flight plan. It's not going to erase your flight plan or anything. It's just going to erase you know, what you just attempted to change. Now, if you want to look at the entire plan on the map display, you can hit plan on the FCU. The next knob over controls the zoom. And then you can use the arrow keys on the MCDU to cycle through each waypoint. The last thing we need to do is enter the performance data. Starting with the decision speed V1, you can enter your own values or double click for the values to be entered for you. Our transition altitude will be flight level 180, and that varies based on country. TO shift is in up, but this is used when you're taking off past the runway threshold, like at an intersection. Otherwise, the computer assumes you're using the full runway. And if you were to use this, let's say you're 200 meters past the threshold, you can enter that value. But we don't need to do this because we're using GPS primary, so it's really not important. Next is the flaps. The format for this can also vary based on performance charts. We'll use 1 slash up 1.2. Normally after doing this it will set the trim for you. It basically means flaps 1 with the trim at up 1.2. If you were using flaps 2 it would be 2 slash up, you know, and then whatever uh, trim setting you're going to use. Last is the flex temp and this is also a number that can vary allows the engines to use the exact power setting they need for takeoff. This way you aren't stressing the engines by using max power when you don't need to. We'll put a flex temp of 45 degrees. That's always been the, the default Aerosoft value, and I'll just use it here today for an example. Uh, otherwise, you can just use toga power, which is full up on the throttle, and we'll get uh, more into that on the takeoff chapter. We can now configure the flight control unit, make sure the flight director is on, the navigation display is on, the constraints are on, the Q&H is set, I and I, HG for the US and HPA for everywhere else. You can also pull the knob for standard mode, but uh, we'll be doing that later on when we get to our transition. Select your climb altitude for the seaward departure. That will be 6,000 feet. That's the first altitude we'll need to go up to. So we'll plug that in. And now repeat everything for the right side. Flight director on, nav on, constraints on, and the Q&H set. Which it's already a cross set from the other one. Also a good time to brighten the first officer panels if not done already. Now we will do the engine start sequence. You can now begin the pushback. I like the free plugin pushback helper or pushback express by FS2 crew is very good too. You can 
control the tug a little better. So with the pushback process starting, we can turn the beacon light on and the parking brake off. Start the clock. Turn the ignition on and master switch 2 on. This will begin starting the right side engine. stable, turn on the master switch 1 to start the left engine. Once both engines are started, we can move the engine mode selector back to normal. Turn off the APU bleed. Turn the APU master switch off. And the probe heat on. The ECAM here also has a list of things for you to confirm. The auto brake is set to max. Pack signs on. Spoilers armed. Flap set, which is flaps one for us and the cabin ready check. You can do this now or closer to the runway by hitting the forward call button twice. Then hit the takeoff config button here and that's all ready to go. If you have the predictive wind shear alert PWS on the ECAM, you can turn it to auto here on the main pedestal. And then while you're down there, make sure the TCAS is set to TARA. With the engine started and the ECAM clear, we will begin to taxi, turn on the runway turnoff lights, the taxi lights, the nav, and the logo light. And then you can turn on the terrain radar if you want. The taxi on the line, I like to line it up with my primary display, or depending on your view, I would recommend lining it up externally first and then see where that line is from the cockpit and then just follow that spot. This will be the same for the rollout on takeoff and landing. It's good to know where that center spot is for yourself. So now we've taxied to runway 27 and I want to brief you on how this is going to work. Once we're on the runway we can either take off with the flex setting that uh, we entered in the MCDU or we can use the takeoff go around mode. Either one is fine. I'll be using flex for today, then we'll roll down the runway, and when we hit the VR speed, we'll begin to gently rotate. And lastly, as we come through about 800 feet, but before 1,000 feet AGL, we need to set the throttle to climb power, and it will remain in this position for the rest of the flight until about 30 feet above the runway when we retard the throttles. If it flips out of climb at any point, you will lose the auto throttle and it will generally overspeed. So if you're suddenly overspeeding, that's usually what happened. So let's go ahead and enter the runway, the landing lights. The strobe light needs to come on. The wing lights. Confirm the auto throttle is on. Power up to 50%. If everything looks stable, move it into the flex or toga position.
rotate. Positive climb, gear up. Set the climb power. And now we're just going to follow the flight director. I'm approaching the slat speed so we can put the flaps up. And you'll notice this high EGT value here, and this is not supposed to happen. This is a bug a lot of people have been encountering since the last update, but that should go away, so we're going to ignore that for now. It seems to happen every time you're in uh, climb, so once we level off and climb again, the EGT will come back up, uh, but like I said, don't worry about that. I'll get the ground spoilers in a moment after I'm done hand flying. You can turn the autopilot on at any moment. We'll do so now. It just works best if you have it as close to the cross in the flight director. As close as possible. And you'll see now that we're leveling off, the EGT is calming down. For the after takeoff checklist, spoilers disarmed. Engine mode selector, as required. Taxi light off. Engine wing and anti-ice, as required. Packs 1 and 2, as required. Initial altitude set. IRS, you can confirm that's aligned again. The flight director cycle off and then on again. The localizer button off. And the FCU, just verify everything is complete and correct. All right, so it's time to go up to 12,000. We'll just plug that in and then push in on the knob. Each of these have a push and pull to them. By hovering over it, you'll get the up arrow and down arrow. We're going to cover that once we get to cruise. I'll show you some additional features of the flight control unit and flying the aircraft. But now heading up to 12,000 feet. So we're passing 10,000 feet, the external lights can go off, the bottom ones at least. And the wing light, or the seatbelt sign can come off if you want. Now we're going to head up to our cruise altitude of 38,000 feet. So again, setting that altitude and then pushing in on the altitude knob. Passing 18,000 so we can set the Q&H to standard mode. you need the anti-ice system, it is located here. If um, you have ice detected, it will tell you on the ECAM, and it will also tell you if ice is not detected. That's if you're using the anti-ice without ice. You'll see that message here. So we're coming up on our cruise altitude now. It's indicated by that blue line on the navigation display. And we're going to level off, and this is where we'll be for the rest of the flight. Now onto the flight control unit. I want to show you some additional things. So if we have a vector from ATC giving us a separate heading to go on, this is how you would do it. You push down on the knob, set your heading, and then push down again. and that'll enter a mode where now you can control the heading. 
and see as we move it back to the left, the plane will start to follow to the left. Do whatever we tell it now in that mode. You just have to hover until you find the down arrows or up arrows. Down will be pull and up will be push. Now if we want to go down, we can either change the altitude and then push in and it'll go down to that altitude or up or you can use the vertical speed mode and as you can see it's following the instruction we're giving it on the primary display I'm just going to cycle it through a, a few different altitudes so you can see it change going down to 2000 and right away it goes to 2000 so that's another way to control your descent or climb Here it is at a thousand. But we don't want to go down to that. We want to stay at 38,000, so we'll just move it back up to 38,000 and push in. Same for the heading, and it should get back on the flight plan if it's right before a waypoint. But just in case it does not do that for you, or you accidentally come off of your flight plan, which can happen quite a bit right now with uh, the MCDU kind of bugging out if you're making changes to it during flight. You can go to the direct button and just select the next waypoint and that'll take you directly to it. It'll draw a line and uh, the plane will follow that over to that waypoint. It's a great feature. It'll get you out of a lot of bad situations. You can also do so with the speed, just push down, and now we can control the speed in Mach. And then push it in again to get back on the manage mode. So next we're going to start the descent, and uh, that'll be indicated by a line. It's usually blue, like the top of climb line you saw earlier. Um, that line you're seeing there is actually, out of coincidence, right where our top of descent is, but it's not the top of descent line. Uh, it's, it's the line that tells you when you're going to hit the altitude that you plugged in to the flight control unit. It just happens to be glitching and being there at this time, but we're going down to flight level 210, and we're going to do this in increments again. The Just the first altitude will be 210. And it's going to fly down in uh, managed mode, but again, you can use the vertical speed if you want. You can also use the speed brake if you need to. So here we are level off at uh, 210 and we're going to go down to 190 now. Just following the constraints on the navigation display there. Or you can use the chart. I would cross check it to the chart to make sure everything is correct. Or we've uh, went down to 19,000, now we're going down to 9,000, so we're going to be passing 18,000 feet. We're setting our Q&H. Happens to be 290 or 902 right now, which is the same as what it is in standard mode, but you want to get standard off after that transition altitude. Passing 10,000 feet, so we'll need our lights back on. 
runway turn off light, the landing lights, the strobe on. So what we're doing now is we've tuned up ATIS and we're on the performance page in the MCDU and we're setting up some information for the approach. The temperature is 30 degrees Celsius in Sacramento right now. Q&H is updated. It's 2 9 9 one now. The wind is also updated. It's now out of 206 at 10 knots. So a little bit of a crosswind. Transition altitude is good, and we just need to set the bar to 200, and this will be the decision height where it uh, says approaching minimums. And then your landing config, you can either go uh, flaps 3 or full. We'll be doing flaps full. now set up for the final approach you can click on the radio nav button just want to verify the uh, ILS frequency and the course heading are correct now we are on approach to Sacramento International coming from the Tenco waypoint I'm just going to make sure it's actually going to fly and make that turn so again I'm using the direct to the uh, next waypoint mode uh, great mode that'll uh, like I said it'll help you out a lot and now I can be sure that it's going to fly and make that base turn. Now if you're on ATC they'll often give you, you know, vectors to uh, line up with the runway. And again that was covered after cruise with the flight control unit showed you how to use the heading. And we're just putting the flaps out now. We want to get, I just want to get fully configured. And usually the second to last waypoint will be your 10 mile radius, so we'll put the landing gear down at that point. and now we're just going to be lining up with the runway and what we want to pay attention to now is these pink diamonds for the ILS approach if the horizontal one moves first you can arm the localizer button on the FCU and the vertical one is actually moving first so as that comes down you can then arm the approach mode and this is going to fly the approach for you it's going to manage the altitude and lining up and we can also go over to the localizer mode and verify the pink line is lining up you also want to start taking a look at the ecam make sure the landing lights are on the seatbelt signs the flaps are set and the spoilers are armed and you want to set your auto brake. We're using medium setting today. Then we can do the cabin check, click it twice on the forward. And now we're stable on the ILS approach. At a thousand feet, we're going to disconnect the autopilot. You can also do it earlier and hand fly it if you want. Very clear day.
disconnecting the autopilot one now. The auto throttle can stay in. And it's going to manage the speed for you. 1,000. We're just going to do our best to follow the flight director down. You can also look at the pappy lights just ahead there. Two red, two white is what you want. Three red means you're a little too low. Three white means you're a little too high. Four red, you're way too low. You should probably go around. And four white, you're too high. And you can always salvage 500. these sometimes, but that's what we want. We got. Two white, two red right now. Four hundred. Just make tiny corrections as you go down. See we got a three red right there, but if you catch it real quick, you can fix it. Hundred right above. Now we're just trying to correct for this crosswind. I always get a crosswind or something when I'm doing a tutorial, but two hundred. Minimum. One hundred, fifty, forty, thirty, twenty, ten, five. Mm, but, uh, all right, reverse thrust out. Coming through eighty, you cut it off. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Pat yourself on the back. You just flew the fly-by-wire A320. Switching to manual braking now. And able to get off the runway without getting the brakes too hot. If you do, you'll get a notice on the ECAM and the brake fan will illuminate and you can then turn that on. So the flaps are coming up. We'll disarm the spoilers, turn off the landing lights, start the APU, probe heat off, unless it's a really cold day. Turning off the landing lights, the strobe, the wing light, and need the runway turnoff light on and the taxi light on still. And that is how it's done. Just gonna turn and make our way into the terminal. I'm gonna show you how to do a Cat 3 auto land next. So stay tuned for that and then we'll come back to this situation and park the aircraft. Alright, so we're gonna do a Cat 3 auto land. Now this is done exactly how we set up the last ILS. Just make sure the runway you're doing it on is for Cat 3s. Now this does not fully function right now with this current version of the fly-by-wire. Uh, the only difference is once you come through 1500 feet you're going to arm the second autopilot and that's what doesn't function right now. You can only arm one so you get the Cat 3 single instead of dual. Uh, but it pretty much does a good job until the last 30 feet or so then it kind of nose dives into the runway. But yeah all the same um, just make sure the ILS frequency is in the uh, navigation, the nav radio portion of the MCDU, along with the course heading, and then arm that second autopilot after 1500. Have it set to zero visibility, just so you can get a good example of this. It allows you to auto land really in blind conditions. For whatever reason, it's a little offset right now, but it's going to correct itself. 400. See, it switched into land mode. That means it's going to do the auto land, but again, not working. 300. 100 above. 200. 
minimum. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. And that's 30, where it goes 20, bad. 10, so it's almost start. there. I mean, it, it almost wants to do it. It just doesn't know what to do with uh, the last feet of the runway. Um, but who knows when you're watching this? So I know a lot of these tutorials I do, people are watching them years later, and this fly-by wire is going to be in a much different state. So it'll probably work by then. Just want to make sure you know how to do it. We did get the brakes a little hot there. That's what I was talking about earlier. So uh, the brake fan illuminates, and you get that ECAM message. We can also turn on the wipers, which at this time do not actually wipe, but hey, they look cool. Now we're about to pull into the gate so we can get the TCAS over to standby. Verify the terrain radar is off. I think the first officer side isn't. You can turn the taxi light off and the runway turnoff light. All right, we're at the gate. Let's turn on the parking brake. Get the engines off. APU bleed on. Running on the APU power now. Start up uh, pushback helper, or again, you can use the EFB to connect the jetway. Turn the seatbelt signs off, the beacon light, the nav, and the logo. Get the strobe completely off. And now we'll just go through the shutdown and secure. Jetways coming up. the flight control unit, the pedestal, the overhead, we're going to switch over to the external power, turn the APU off, the IRS system off, fuel pumps, Emergency exit lights off. And this is where you would turn off the MCDUs. You just keep hitting that until they go off, but that doesn't work right now. You can just dim them. Get everything off on the FCU. And let's get external power off 
and get those batteries. Might have a little juice left in the APU. And there it goes. So that's it. That is operating the Fly-By-Wire A320. I really hope this was helpful with for you guys. Put a lot of effort into trying to make this tutorial really good for you. Um, I'll do more in the future. Um, these are just uh, very labor-intensive to make, but helpful to the community, so that's why I like to do them. So, alright guys, hope you learned. Take care.